Welcome to Side Alpha Leadership, a podcast where leaders can share their experiences and discuss what leadership means to them. I'm your host, David Polikoff. Hello and welcome to this month's episode of Side Alpha Leadership. I'm your host, David Polikoff. Uh, pleased to have on the phone once again with me is uh, Frank Ritchie. Last time uh, Frank and I were on the show, we talked about interviewing and setting yourself up for, uh, for your job. Um, and Frank had prepared me for my interview for the per- position that I currently hold now. Uh, worked out very well. And, and uh, with, uh, without rambling on like I do, Frank, welcome back to the show. Dave, honored to be on the show. Thanks for having me. So one thing I wanted to tell you, and I know I've told you this before, but I want to get it out there uh, so it's recorded and and for for my uh, tens and and dozens of listeners out there, um, the show that we did where we talked about interviewing and all that stuff actually had a guy from Frederick County, uh, where I'm currently employed now, um, was concerned about going in for his interview for battalion chief. So he talked to our mutual friend, RJ, and RJ said, hey, man, Dave and Frank just did a podcast show on that. Go listen to the show. So the guy told me he listened to the show and uh, took all the pointers that we had, and I was actually on the interview panel. Um, this is before I knew any of this stuff. And uh, he scored number one in the on the test, number one on the interview, the whole nine yards. He was the only one that bought a resume and supplied it. We did everything virtual, so he had emailed us his resume and had it all set up like the one that you had set up for me. And uh, he scored number one and got, was the first one hired. You, that's great. You'd think he'd send me a sweatshirt or something. <laughs> you would think. I do have Frederick County shirt for you. I promise you I will give it to you, and you will receive it before Dave McGlynn sends you his sword from uh, West Point. I guarantee you that. Uh, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> so anyway, so today, um, and for those who don't know, Frank and I, we co-host a, a radio show for Politics and Tactics for Fire Engineering, uh, which I enjoy doing. Um, and I enjoy doing this as well because we talk about different different aspects of leadership when it comes to the fire service. Um, get to talk to a multitude of different people from the fire department, police department, military, business world, just to get their take on on leadership. And what I find that that uh, it doesn't matter what line of work you're in, some of the leadership traits carry over between all uh, businesses. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about. Kitchen table talks. Um, Most of the people in the fire service know what that is. Um, I want to talk about uh, interpersonal communications of talking one-on-one with each other, uh, resolving conflicts and things like that, and then talk a little bit about uh, um, killing rumors before they get uh, spread and and get out of control and and, uh, and how to handle something like that. So without uh, further ado, uh, let's jump right into kitchen table talks. I found it pretty successful as a battalion chief when I worked for Montgomery County. Uh, I would make it a point to go and visit every station in my battalion. And uh, first I'd meet with the captain behind closed doors just to see how things were going, find out if there was any rumors, any brewing issues, any concerns he may have. We'd talk to one-on-one. And then we'd go out and just kind of sit at the kitchen table and just have really open conversations about stuff. And uh, in the beginning... It took a while for them to warm up to me, but once they kind of knew who I was and knew that I was genuine, um, it was amazing of the things that they talk about. So, so shine a little bit of light on that, Frank. And what were your experiences as a battalion chief and as a boss when uh, you would have these kitchen table talks or these coffee table talks with your people? Well, you talked about the military, so I want to go back to General Patton real quick. And it's very important for rank. So General Patton, a lot of people know the story where a soldier was shell-shocked, which would be PTSD, today, and he slapped him. He interacted with him, and it was one of the reasons they said he stayed at where he was as a general instead of going either even further up the ranks or maybe if he didn't die, president of the United States. But he got a really stern rebuke from interacting with the staff. So we have to realize as leaders that we never want to undermine or diminish the command of those under us. So generally my rule for any officer or business person is that your communication 
as a boss. So let's take a, a captain. You should be talking to the battalion chief and two ranks below you, which would be a lieutenant and a firefighter. If, if you're a battalion chief, you should be talking to the deputy and the captains and the lieutenants for formal conversation. So in other words, when you walk into that firehouse and you see somebody that looks like a slob or doing something inappropriate, don't fall into that trap that a great general Patton fell into by interacting with the firefighter. That person is out of your purview. And if you interact with them on a substantive issue, I'm not talking about saying hi and asking how the family is, I'm talking about a substantive issue, you're actually undermining your officers and you're diminishing and undermining your own command. That's the time to go talk to the captain and say, hey, what's going on with this? Don't interact negatively with anybody. I think that's a great rule. I think it's a great rule for CC and people. And there's so many officers out there who diminish their own command and they don't even realize they're doing it. Yeah, that's, I, I agree a hundred percent. I always made it a point that if there was something that I, I had a question about or something that I, I didn't, maybe I wasn't seeing the full story. I would always go to the officer in charge and ask, hey, what's going on with this particular person? There may be a perfectly logical uh, explanation, um, or it could be one of those, Captain was having an off day, hey, cat Chief, this slipped my mind, my apologies, and then let that captain go out or that lieutenant go out and correct the issue because those are his people. Um, to cut the knees off of your officer by not allowing him to address his people of any shortcomings or – any praises is uh, you're 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 setting yourself up to uh, to really like you said diminish your command. So very sage advice. Okay, so now we get to the actual table itself. First off, if the crew invites you to eat with them, realize that as a chief, you're not going to be running out the door to go to emergency generally as often as they are. So you should eat last, and you should always get up to do your own dish. If they take the dish from you and say, ah, chief, we got this, then that's fine. Just say, thank you. And always pay for your meal. Don't ever come across as being cheap. If you're the battalion chief, you're the deputy, you've reached a position of esteem, you're making more money than that rank and file firefighter. Think about when you were that probationary firefighter, or even in a volunteer department where you're, where people are volunteering, you have that position of esteem. Don't be taking money from the crew. It's just, it's really bad form. I, I agree again. Again, I agree that uh, what I've done is, <clears throat> again, eat and last um, because the chances, like you said, of you as the battalion chief going out the door is those chances are pretty low, but that medic unit or that ambulance or even that engine company, you know, going out the door for a medical run or a fire call is much greater. So, you know, let those guys get their food, let them start eating. And again, when you're done, pick your plate up, rinse your plate off. Now, I've always uh, taken it a step further because you'll always have uh, one of the younger, oh, chief, I got that for you. And I've always kind of backed it up with, you don't think I know how to do a dish? You don't think I know how to do my own dishes? I get it that they're trying to be um, respectful, and and uh, but those guys, my guys, when I was a battalion chief, they worked so hard all day long. They put in a hundred percent when it was hot, when it was cold. We we all know how the Mid Atlantic is. Um, I can do my own dish, and uh, a lot of times when those guys, there were many times where they would run calls, and uh, I would either cover their food up or the ones that were done. I'd wash the dishes. I remember there was a few times where I actually finished cooking dinner for those guys because they're out running calls. To me, just those little things really help build your credibility and, and uh, build your leadership um, credibility amongst the, the you know, peers. And as for Pan, absolutely. You know, you're at a position now where, yeah, they say, oh, chief, we got you covered. Um, then, Go buy dessert. You know, if they adamantly refuse to take the money from you, go buy them dessert. Um, I'm at a point now where when we do our station visits, 
I am of the firm belief that I don't walk into a station that I'm being invited to to sit down empty-handed, so I always come with a box of donuts. Um, and I'm the only one in the senior staff that does that, and I always put a little note like, uh, you know, from volunteer services, love Shane and Dave. Shane's my boss. Um, and we always put a dozen donuts down, and, and uh, eventually uh, the other senior staff's going to see that, and, and, and maybe they'll rise to that occasion. But uh, everything you said uh, is 100% correct, uh, Frank. Well, there's, there's a couple important lessons, and the fact that you put your boss's name on it and you simply say it's from the chief's office, that builds their command and actually builds your command. That's a stand-up thing. The only thing I'm going to disagree with you on, or a little bit different perspective, I agree. If they get a call, continue cooking or cover up their food by far. But if somebody, especially a younger person, wants to wash your dish because you're a chief, then let them wash your dish. And let me explain to you why. Go back to Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter carried his own bags into the White House. He was the people's man, and it affected his command presence as commander and chief. He was always trying to be the ordinary man. You want to be humble, as whether you're male or female, but you want to be humble in your position of command, but you don't want to give away all of the pomp and circumstance. I was at a... Um, Plaque dedication in New York City, a company on the Bronx uh, Expressway. And Jay Jonas, I believe he's a deputy at FDNY now, um, one of the most famous FDNY chiefs in modern time after 9-11. And we were talking, and on the sink was a Sharpie with two names written on it. It said FF, and it had the name FF, meaning firefighter, and had the name. And we were talking about that, and they said, in this company, twenty, I think it's 27 trucks, um, Howard Blythe Firehouse, when you get assigned to that company, you sign your name as a probationary firefighter in a Sharpie on the stainless steel commercial grade sink. And when the next probie comes, you, you know, you take a little acetone, you rub it off, and the next person writes your name because they own that sink to wash dishes. So now here's the deputy chief of FDNY. He's talking to us and he goes, you know, one of the things I regret in my career and I'm like, oh, I wonder what this is going to be. And he goes, I regret I didn't have a picture of when my name was on that sink because we need to instill that work ethic. And I'm going to draw from my neighbor, uh, Miles Sedona, who uh, was Green Beret, and he said, listen, we only do cool things 10% of the time, you know, 5% of the time, but it's what you do that other 90% of the time that really – makes you a good soldier, you know, if you're the one that cleans the weapons and makes sure that you're all squared away. Those are the ones you can count on in combat. Well, it's no different in the firehouse. We know that across the board. If you're the one that does an extra 15 minutes of work, and that's really all you have to do, you're going to be the one that can be counted on in a fire. So when they want to do your dish, I'll just respectfully disagree. Let them wash your dish because they are paying some respect to the rank. So just expand on that one more note. And yeah. When I was a company officer, if the, if the fire truck was dirty, you, another example of this, um, I wouldn't go get on the PA and say, hey, it's time to uh, wash the fire truck because my crew was great. They were dedicated. My driver was awesome, knew every hydrant in the city. He was just a phenomenal driver. So I wasn't going to ever call him out. But what I would do is I would get up and start washing the truck. And then all of a sudden, everybody would see, wait, the boss is washing the truck. And they would all come in. And I continue to wash it for a second. But then I would kind of fade back, maybe just grab the hose and rinse. And then I would just disappear. So, again, you want to avoid that, whether you're Democrat or Republican. You want to avoid diminishing your own rank like Carter and think more like a Ronald Reagan. It's, it's funny. You mentioned uh, <clears throat> the sink at the firehouse. It's uh, engine 46, ladder 27. Um, coincidentally, that's where uh, Chris Slutman, a good friend of mine who was uh, killed in Afghanistan, he was assigned there. And uh, we were just there last year, myself and another uh, firefighter. They were doing a dedication to him. They were putting his picture and his plaque up in the station. And uh, we went back for the night shift. And uh, before we rolled out, I wanted to thank those guys for the hospitality, for hosting and everything. And that sink is still there. And there are firefighters' names in Sharpie on that sink. 
Um, so the tradition still lives up to uh, at least a year ago. So, and I'm sure it's 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 continuing to go. So, um, some stand up guys at that particular house, uh, a lot of pride there. Um, and I get what you're saying with with the uh, you know allowing the the, uh, the younger guys to wash your plate. I always found it hard, and of course that's why I married up. My wife constantly reminds me of this. Is is I always found it. Uh, it was embarrassing. I don't know what the exact emotion is of when somebody would do something for me. I was never the kind of chief that my car, I pull into a station to, to uh, one of my stations I visit at and they immediately want to wash my car. It's like, guys, you don't have to wash my car. I wash it in the morning. I appreciate that you respect me enough that you want to do that. But, uh, you know, I dirty my car. I'll, I'll clean it up. You guys do so much work. I always felt that way. Maybe that's being overly humble. Um, my wife would constantly tell me, just like you said, Frank, that uh, these guys want to do that for you. Let them do it because it's a show, sign of respect. But it always makes me feel like I was they they had to be obligated to do that because the chief was in the in in quarters and uh i never got over that but i understand what you're saying you know my wife said the same thing and i was she's one of the smartest people i know um but uh i always felt that it, it wasn't owed to me I'll, I'll clean my own car but uh, you know every now and then they'd, they'd sneak one in on me uh, or grab my plate and wash it or whatever and it became a game but i understand exactly where you're coming from with uh with the guys. And, and I do think it's important that, uh, like you said, when they invite you for dinner, not only do you pay for your food, not only do you, you pick up your own dish, but they want you to stay there. Don't rush out as soon as dinner's over because they want FaceTime with the boss. So expand a little, expand a little bit on that. Okay. So here's one of the, the other traps that officers fall in. And this is managers across the board in any industry is that when you become a manager you kind of get into that politician stump speech, especially if you're going to every firehouse or every police uh, outpost or whatever it may be. You kind of get into that stump speech, and sometimes you're just talking too much because you got to remember you're being invited at that kitchen table in an informal setting. So the real power at that table is twofold. One, you want to keep it kind of light. It's okay to tell. You know, the war story, as long as you don't go overboard, it's okay to have a small stump speech that you're going to repeat at every firehouse, but you really want to use this as an opportunity. The real way to build your command is to ask questions and listen. And as officers, sometimes we're so, we're so in tune to being in charge, it's almost hard to just ask questions. And I teach negotiations throughout the entire country. And I always say, hey, the person who's sitting at the table that makes a decision is always negotiating in a position of weakness. You want to be able to ask questions. You want to be able to get garner as much information as possible. So I challenge everybody to play a game. And the game is very simple. The next time you go to a firehouse or you are talking to one of your friends on the phone, you know, you, you kind of give your, you know, your three minutes, some speech or whatever you got to get out. And then See how long you can go with just asking questions without making a statement. You're going to be amazed how long you can go. And eventually you'll have to make a statement to carry it through. But at the end of this interaction, who's ever on the other side, first off, they're not going to realize you're doing it. Second, you're going to get better at it. But most importantly, most importantly, you're going to garner so much information and they're going to think, that this conversation was great. Because remember, you're not really supposed to be talking and having a debate about substantive issues. You just want to be garnering information. And it also avoids some of that, especially when you have rank, some of those hard topics that we want to stay away from at work. Um, Just asking questions puts you in a position where you don't have to take a position. And it's something that I really had to work at and learn as I went through the ranks and as union president. Um, my wife's brilliant at it. She can interrogate me and just have a complete conversation by asking questions. And it's amazing what she gets out of me. And I think that's, again, <clears throat> to be able to not only, like you said, ask that question, but actively listen to their answers. Um once and like you said when you get good at it and it took me a while 
to uh, to feel comfortable doing it. Where I would just ask questions, start it off really light, like, "Hey guys, what's going on? What have you heard? Any good rumors? You know, just something like that, or you know, what, what that'll usually morph into. Well, I heard about this, or I heard about that, and and actively listen to them. You'll find that um, when when they genuinely see that you're listening to them and you're taking an interest in their conversation that they're going to respect you they're going to look at you as you know not just just the boss but somebody who also cares about what they think and how they feel and that uh they're going to come to you when there is a serious issue and and uh i had had a series of kitchen cable talks when we just talked about morale and uh it, you know, that first one is like, hey, guys, you know, this is what I've heard. You know, like you said, give that little stump speech. And this is where I'm coming from. This is what I heard. Um, I want to pick y'all's brains. What do you think about morale in the department? And I just throw that open-ended question out there. And I always started with the youngest people at the, t- at the table because I wanted their officers to hear what the answers were. And then you would find that that just sparks more and more conversation. And I found that I was barely asking questions at that point they were going around the table i may ask for a little clarity and i was feverishly taking notes so i gained a ton of information so i think like you said to be able to to ask questions actively listen and allow your people to to engage with you um on a more personal level at the kitchen table i think pays huge dividends in the long run a good tactic when somebody when say you start that conversation at the kitchen table And you're starting off by saying, hey, um, what are the latest rumors or something to that? Or somebody comes up and gives you a rumor. Never admit, never admit, this is a negotiator in me, never admit that you haven't heard the rumor. So what you say as a boss is, yeah, I heard that, but I don't know if it's true or I do not think it's true. And by saying that, because... The reason that somebody's telling you a rumor is to create an obligation, to gain influence. I'm giving information that that person doesn't know. That creates influence in a social setting. So to avoid anybody creating the appearance of influence, when somebody, and I used this trick as a union president all the time, would come up to me and say, did you hear this? I'd be like, yeah, but I don't think it's true. Or "Uh, I I don't know if that's true or not. And by saying that, what you actually do is you encourage the other person to give you more information to convince you that it's true. And you didn't even ask a question. And all you got to do is sit there and effectively listen, and you'll really be able to get some good information. I think that that's one thing that we can all agree on that uh, <clears throat> when we have downtime, firefighters are really good at, at uh, finding the, just the slightest little something and turning it into a huge rumor and next thing you know it's, it's around the county around the city so kind of morphs into to where we're going with this conversation when we talk about rumors and and as a chief or as a boss how what's the best tactic to use when you feel that morale is kind of low based around bad rumors or things like that what would you uh what would be your advice to um to try to head off any bad rumors or any rumors that you know probably aren't true or maybe there's a little fraction of truth to it, but it's being taken out of context. But you don't want that rumor to, to ramp up and, and kind of poison the whole battalion or, or the whole county. Okay, a couple things. One, I don't really put a lot of weight or stock in the morale issue because it's the fire service. It's the greatest job in the world, whether you're a volunteer, whether you're career nobody's going to another place and a lot of times we're just a victim of our own because we have a lot of downtime um i would never tell a politician that but because we have a lot of downtime there's just it kind of creates this complaining class this complaining class if you give into it so the morale when you actually ask some pointed questions you know say they're complaining about the chief of department uh dave how long did you work in Montgomery County, Maryland? 35 years? 34 years. 34 years. How many chiefs did you go through? Ooh, um, we started off, I'd say, maybe six to eight. Six to eight. And that's common across the country. Some places it's higher. So the fact is, in your career, the upper echelons change all the time. And 
if words are important enough to be spoken, then action is needed. Try to bring forth a solution instead of just a complaint. And this is something as an officer, you work with your senior personnel and you say, listen, I don't want this to be a shift of complaints and rumors. And if you're an officer and you're going on your eighth medical call of the night, if you complain about that, guess what? Your whole shift's going to complain about it. It's kind of like when you come home, if you're a boss and you sit at the table and all you do is complain, everybody's going to complain. It's when you go home and you have a dog. If you go home and you just walk in real calmly, a lot of times the dog's just going to greet you. But if you come home real excited, guess what? The dog's going to feed off your energy. And as a boss and as somebody in command, you have to realize that the whole crew at that kitchen table is feeding off your energy. So make sure you're not complaining at the table. Call a friend in a different department and complain. Work with your senior personnel to say, hey, listen, we don't want to have an internal complaining class. And hey, kill some of these rumors. I, I got a great real life story about this that I just put in the command presence book that I'm, uh, should be out next year at FDIC is I talk to my senior people about shutting down rumors. So I'm in my office and my senior person who's got like 30 years on the job, he's talking to a whole bunch of new firefighters. And while sex shouldn't be a conversation at work at all, I'm hearing a conversation from my office down the hall of somebody sleeping with somebody else's wife. And before I could walk out to say, cut this out, I heard my senior person say, hey, cut it out. We're not going to talk about that here at work. And for a second, for a second, Dave, I was so proud. I was like, oh, my God, this is actually working. But then the firehouse came to a B. And the next thing he said was, but. If you're the one sleeping with her, I want to know all about it. <laughs> so I chalked that up as kind of, ah, halfway lost. <laughs> but, you know, but, but at least I was trying and he was trying. But you want to try to keep complaining down. Because you're complaining as a boss, everybody's going to be complaining. Yeah, I agree. And I've, I've always told and I've tried to pride myself on this that, that you never complain down. Um, like you said, you cannot sit at the table and complain, you know, as the captain, complain to lieutenants and the firefighters. Um, and as a battalion chief, I can't sit at the table and complain to, to the captains and whatnot. I can complain to my boss, like, hey, you know, this is becoming an issue, whatever. Um, and, and like you said, I don't want to just offer complaints. I want to try to put together some reasonable solutions. I always made it a habit. I've told, I always tell my captains, you can come to me with any complaint, any issue, whatever it is that you have. I said, but you need to have some sort of working solution. It might not be the best. It might be rough. But at least I know you, that you're not only just feeding complaints because it's easy to do. You're also coming at me with potential solutions and then maybe we can work some stuff like that out. I think that that in the long run makes us stronger officers. Like we know things happen. We know whether whether you want to call it morale or you know running that 15th medical call of the shift and, and the shift is, is complaining about it. Um, maybe there's, maybe there, there's a solution to it come at me with a solution and maybe we can work around that. So I think that, uh, you know, my advice would be um, there's always going to be complaints, but you cannot complain to the people that you're in charge of. Dave, something really funny happened two days ago. So I have a granddaughter, and I, I hate because that sound makes me sound old. I'm only 48. <laughs> but I have a granddaughter, and she's, she's turning three. So she's talking to her mother about the cake and her mom says we're going to get you an ice cream cake and she's i guess i don't know if they were in the, the supermarket looking at the shelf or whatever but she said we're going to get an ice cream cake for your birthday party next month or in a couple weeks and so zoe grace looks at her and instead of saying as a firefighter would say or a cop no i don't want the cake what she said was she looked at her mother and she said mom you could get the ice cream cake for your party. I want that cake. And she pointed to another cake, and I go, that kid is a brilliant negotiator. That's right. She's going places. <laughs> she, she said no, but gave a solution and made it appear to be win-win. 
Like she gave her mom permission to have the ice cream cake. I go, that is just great. That is the next uh, next uh, story for your next book. <laughs> yeah. I think when I get the first edition uh, edit back, which should be coming in the next 30 days, I think I'm going to add that story in because there's a chapter on negotiation. But I was like, that's pretty brilliant. She said no, but made it look like you were winning. Um, that's negotiations. Um, we talked a little bit about rumors. What if the rumors about you or about your department? One of the things is don't allow the rumor to spread. And one of the worst things is, is when the rumor comes from one of your own friends or somebody that say, you know, that you came up with and don't let it bust fester. As soon as you hear about it, you know, when I was a union president, I'd be at the academy, everybody would come down for training. I'd hear the latest rumor. Usually it was Justin McCarthy creating some rumor about me. As soon as I heard it, I'd be at his firehouse pulling up on the apron, everybody at the kitchen table, and I would address the rumor. I would kill it right then and there. People are so shocked when you take things head on, when you just say, hey, everybody at the table, let's have an honest conversation about this, because this is what I hear, but this is how things really are. And then I would allow open debate and conversation, and it was a very effective way of killing rumors. So if you hear something about yourself as a chief and you're running a battalion, don't shy away from it. Don't get mad at somebody. Go there, sit down at the t- if they're an officer or, you know, if they're a firefighter, if they're more than two ranks below, go to the officer first, but address it. Say, this is what I heard. This is the truth. Just kill it, nip it right in the bud. Yeah, it's it's funny. Um, I'm sure there were many rumors about me. Not a lot of them ever came, I got to me. Um, but when I, when I was uh, applying for uh, the position that I'm in now, it's funny because <clears throat> I started the applying pro- application process in July of last year, and uh, I think by August, uh, I had all kinds of congratulations, heard you got the job, and this and that, and I'm like, dude, I haven't even had a phone call or an interview yet, um, and I must, I, I probably had that about six or seven times, so I actually did have to sit down with the officers and the firefighters in my battalion and said, look, to be totally honest, totally transparent, yes, I applied for this position three weeks ago. I haven't even gotten an interview yet. I haven't even gone through the process. So, no, I don't have the job. Um, and and uh, it, it wasn't until the end of October when they finally made an offer for me. But I think when it, as far as rumors go, I think that's about as close as it, uh, as it got to me where I actually had to sit down and, and address it just because I didn't want my guys to feel that, oh, well, look, everybody knows you got the job. You didn't even bother to say anything to us. Um, so like, like you said, I had, I had to kind of squash that right then and there. It was kind of funny, you know, how everybody knew I got the job except me, but, um, but I guess that that's kind of how rumors go. Um, I think that's, that's great. And that's what people want, especially in the fire service. Everybody thinks they work for the FBI. Um, there's very few secrets in the fire service that really mean anything. Um, that really has to be secret unless it's a, a very distinct personnel uh, employee assistance program type of situation, but there's very little that's confidential. And all too often, um, chiefs, I call it false command presence, where they they just try to isolate the ranks when it comes to information. You want information flowing as freely as possible, especially when the way you communicate the vision of the chief is through conversations and meetings and SOPs and policies and things of that nature. So don't be so locked in to information. Does, is this information really proprietary? One thing that was funny is when I made lieutenant as a firefighter, we had um, a chief of operations that almost every call would call one or two officers to the side to talk to them like there was a big secret. And everybody always wondered, you know, what the hell is all this about? Like, what are they talking about? So when I finally got made as a lieutenant, that chief called me over. My company's there. We're at, we're at a job. Job's pretty much over. We're, we're cleaning up. And he's like, and I forget what he told me, but it was like completely benign. So while he was standing there, I turned around and said, hey, crew, this is what the chief said. And I repeated everything he said. And everybody got it because they knew that that was just his M.O. Um, secrets and things of that breed distrust, especially when 90% of the stuff that they keep confidential in fire service 
doesn't have to be confidential. It can be freely said as long as it's respectful. The other thing that we have to mention when you're in that social setting sitting at the table is whatever you let go becomes the new minimum standard. So while you don't want to get into it with a firefighter, somebody two ranks below you, it's important that if somebody says something that's inappropriate, that you either address it with a look where everybody sees you give the look, kind of like the look that your mother gave you, or by simply saying, cut it out. And I've had to do that numerous times as a company officer, as a chief officer, as a union president, is that, hey, cut it out. Because you can't just let something go. That doesn't mean that you get into a back and forth with that person. If it was to escalate and the person says something back to you, that's when you get up to the table and say, Captain, I need to see you in the office. And you walk out of the room. You never can let anybody get you heated at a table or emotional. Whoever gets emotional is thinking with their heart and not their head. And you're always at a position of weakness and you're diminishing your own command. But if you're sitting at the table and somebody says something that cannot be said at work, remember that even in volunteers, there's a professional environment. Everybody has a seat at the table. If something's said that could harm the reputation of the fire department or increase the liability to the fire department, you have a responsibility to say, cut it out. And if it continues, take the officer out of the room. Yeah, I think that that's uh, <clears throat> excellent advice. And, and what that does, you know, is to be able to, to just nip it right then and there, um, depending upon the severity of what it was, uh, it doesn't warrant paperwork. It, it, was, it, it was dealt with right then and there. And that's the end of it. Um, obviously, if it's something of a severe nature, uh, whether it's an HR issue, <clears throat> then it may have to go further. But uh, you're exactly right. And, and it also, you know, people need to understand is, is when you say whatever you let go is the new norm, <clears throat> if you have a uniform policy that's in place, um, whether you like it or not, if it's a policy, it no longer matters. It's what it is. And uh, if you've got a bunch of people sitting at the table, they're out of uniform, they're not wearing the right shirts or whatever, and you let that go, that's an open invitation. Well, obviously the chief didn't mind, and that's the new norm, like you said. Um, we, have, we have, I have a funny story. We, we have a new uniform policy at work, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, some people don't like it. Some people, you know, don't care one way or the other. Um, but... We're sitting at the table and they start talking, the, the, the crews start talking about the uniform policy and how, you know, they're not very fond of it and, and that, uh, you know, they don't understand what was going on. You know, why did it have to change and why are they doing this? And the guy that's making the, the argument has a hole in his shirt under the armpit that comes up to almost the shoulder. And I'm amazed that he's trying to formulate an argument against the new uniform policy He's clearly wearing a shirt that has a hole in it. So I just found that whole thing kind of amusing, you know, pointed it out to my boss later. I said, what would have happened if I was in Montgomery County is while he was talking, I would have reached over, grabbed the hole, and ripped the entire side of his shirt off. And he asked me to get a new shirt on. But uh, it's things like that. If you let things like that slide, then like you said, that's the new norm. And uh, even if you don't agree with the policy, at that point it doesn't matter. You still have to endorse it. You have to carry the chief's flag uh, and, and follow, follow the rules, um, you know, of the day or of, of, of the uh, company. I agree, but some of the policies out there are ridiculous or so outdated. And if that's the case, don't try to ignore it, but try to change it in a constructive way. So if the issue is about uh, we got to wear these collar shirts all the time, you know, that's kind of where uh, – battalion chief could advocate you know is there an exception if they're eating dinner if they're not public facing um if they're doing a drill they can be in a t-shirt that doesn't have holes in it and um is approved but you just can't ignore the policy because then you're diminishing your own command one thing we see a lot of times is which is even worse is when the officer doesn't follow the policy to a t but then tries to enforce the policy. Um, we had that in New Haven. Um, I won't say who it was, the current chief of operations. And <laughs> he, we had a policy that you had to wear from the union that we had to wear cotton shirts. You, you couldn't wear a polyester shirt. But he's, he's like a really fit individual. And he looks sharp. 
but he wants to wear a polyester shirt. And I'm taking this from the union side. I loved it because I'm like, look, no one's ever going to get in trouble for a uniform policy because he's diminishing his own command. And every person he tried to write up, I would just laugh at right out of the chief's office. I'm like, the guy's out of uniform. He's a joke. They're laughing at him as soon as he leaves the firehouse. He's diminishing his own command. You can't try to enforce something that you're not following. And it almost sounds like a dumb thing to even bring up, but it's amazing how many fire departments, police departments, military have the same issue. You know, you can't say, hey, you got to do something if you're not willing to do it. Yeah, I mean, you take, take uh, you know, look at the NFL, <clears throat> the, the uniform policy that they have there. I mean, they have to wear um, the exact same thing. Uh, the shirts have to be the same. Socks have to be the same. Shoes have to be the same, you know. So, you know, and even in the military, you know, you're not an individual in a military. You're a group. And the fire department is, is, a, is a, a quasi-military organization, and um, it's bound by policies. Yes, there are policies out there that, that can be a little absurd. I've always – I had always told my captains, if I come in at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and your guys are in T-shirts, I'm going to assume because you're a good officer that there's a reason. And there's no reason for me to sit there and tell everybody, you guys got to get your uniform shirts on. Um, I, I leave that latitude to – to the uh, captain, but the policy was always that when you were on a call, when you're out in public, you got your uniform shirt on, and they never gave me a reason to uh, to say like, "Hey, look, you're not wearing your uniform in public." You know what the policy says? They they always followed followed that particular policy when we talked about uniforms. But like you said, if 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 you are willing to let things slide as a command officer, or, <clears throat> you know, in the station, what are you going to let slide on the fire ground that could result into an injury or so, or something of that nature? And, and uh, people might say, "Well, that's a big leap," but no, it's it's not. You know, we, we do run into things like that where we allow, uh, if we allow freelancing just this one time, then it, it'll creep into something else. And um, you know, rules are there for a reason. Um, that, uh, again, like you said, you have to make sure that uh, you are abiding by it because if you're letting it slide, then that's, like you said, the new norm. Um, and, you, of, Dave, yes. um, if you're at the table and those guys are adding uniform or you see them at an event and uniform, again, don't say anything to them. Say something to the officer because one of the surest signs of weakness as a new chief of department, new administrative officer, or new chief – is a lot of times when people are insecure about the position they achieved, the first thing they go after, and this is across the country, is the uniform. And they simply just harp on it like it's the most important thing ever. Uh, Dave Rose from Atlanta wrote a brilliant article called The T-Shirt Police. So don't get into it with rank-and-level firefighters about the uniform because the chances are if you work in any city or major metropolitan area, there's problems beyond the uniform. And if you're at the chief's level, you got to be focusing on all the problems, not just the uniform. And if the rank and file think that your biggest issue is the uniforms because that's their only interaction with you, and if you walk up and you say, oh, where's your collared shirt, you actually diminish your own command. That's why to protect your command, you should be talking to the officers, building your officers, and mentoring your officers. And I've always tried to tell <clears throat> new battalion chiefs, new captains, to always ask the question. You know, if, like you said, pull them in the office. Hey, uh, I noticed everybody is not in uniform. What's going on? He might say, hey, chief, we just finished uh, degreasing the ladder truck and, and whatever. You know, there could be an excuse. But if you go in, you know, full bore of, like, your guys are in a uniform. You know what the policy is. They're supposed to be in the uniform. And then when that explanation comes, you kind of look like an ass. And, and like you said, you lose that credibility. But, again, uniforms is what – you will see most people try to attack, and you're right. If that's what we're attacking, then everything else in the fire service must be great because there's <laughs> there's other things that we really need to focus on. Um, so into the last subject, which is actually the middle subject, but it will be the last one, I want to talk a little bit about interpersonal communication and one-on-one -on -one communication. Uh, one of the things that I'm finding in my new position is that there's a lot of – uh, interaction, one-on-one -on -one interaction with the volunteers, with the careers, you know, career and career, volunteer and volunteer and, and combination wise. Um, but one of the things that I'm seeing is, is this lack of communication and more so of asking a question to get an answer as opposed to, I didn't like what that guy did. 
Uh, so therefore, I'm going to file a formal complaint, and it goes up the chain of command, and it's got to be investigated. And a lot of the complaints that I've seen and some that I've had to handle was like, man, if, if this was me, I would have pulled that guy aside and said, hey, man, why'd you do this? And, uh, oh, hey, I didn't like that you did that. Um, and it could have been 100% a misunderstanding. Yet we don't have that communication. Is it something that we're, we're lacking? Is it something that we're not taught now, you know, when we're coming through school? Are our parents not talking to us? Because I've always been the kind of person, if something bothers me or if somebody bothers me, I'm going to go talk to them as opposed to deciding to drop paperwork and make somebody else handle my problem. Okay, I think it's a cultural issue. I think it's a breakdown in the family. It's an educational issue. And, you know, the fire department is kind of a microcosm of all of those things come together. It, you know, it makes up the population. So you're bringing all of those external factors to the firehouse. When somebody puts up a complaint where you actually look at the complaint, I always tell people, take a look at it and make a determination is the complaint petty or is it trivial? You know, if it's petty, then usually it's a sign of immaturity and they may need them, the person who wrote the complaint may need some counseling and maybe not counseling so much, but some coaching and mentoring. And is this complaint a symptom of another problem? You know, it should kind of lead you down that road of asking questions of, is it really about this or is this just a symptom of something else that's going on? And by asking those key questions as the investigator, you know, sometimes you can prevent something or someone uh, going really on a course that's going off base. If it's trivial, um, where, and now both words, petty and trivial, mean the same thing. So my boss is a, was the editor of the Harvard Law Review, so she hates when I say this because the definition is the same. But when it comes to interpersonal skills, I think it takes on a different meaning. If it's trivial, you got to look if there's a political aim to it. What are they trying to accomplish and put forward? Because there may be an agenda there. Now, a lot of times when there's an agenda, it's actually to project strength, but sometimes it's just political bullshit. So you got to kind of kind of figure out that a, a good example of this when i was talking about this today is during the paris peace accords when they were negotiating the peace for vietnam the american negotiators they rented like a floor of a hotel for week on end so in other words every week they'd have to re-up their their stay at the hotel the vietnamese rented a villa for the year and then when they got to the table they brought forth what the Americans thought was a petty issue, but it wasn't. It was a trivial issue. They were actually projecting strength through a political agenda. The very first thing at the Paris Peace Accords, when we had you know, several countries at war in Vietnam and people dying, the Vietnamese wanted to project strength. So the first issue they brought up was the size and shape of the table. They were portraying to the Americans that we're not going to be bullied at this table, that we're going to argue over the shape of it. Because we're here for the long haul. We have an agenda, and we're going to make sure that we succeed in the long run. And lo and behold, the State Department was completely out-negotiated by the, by the North Vietnamese. So, again, look at, is this complaint trivial? Is it petty? And is there a political agenda? Is it a sign of, do I need to coach? Do I need to mentor? Do I need to counsel? And really ask yourself that question, is this a symptom of a greater problem. I, I hope that answers your question. It does, and I think there's a lot of that, and I understand what you're saying. I think some of it is a symptom of a greater problem, um, and I'm, I'm not sure. I have my ideas how to solve it. I think the biggest thing is is to 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 tell people is like you know I always say like. You know, when there's a complaint, I said, well, did you, did you ask that person these questions? I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Did you ask this person this following question? No. Did you talk to this person about this? No. Did you tell this particular person that, hey, what you did wasn't right in my eyes. Why did you do that? And the answer is always no. Um, <clears throat> and, and I'm like, we wouldn't be sitting here had you asked that question because now I don't know what those answers are. It could have been something as simple as... I didn't realize I was doing that. My bad. 
And that's the end of it. But I think we're, we're, I'm running into this where the I don't know if they know how to talk to each other. I don't know if they're afraid to talk to each other or if they feel like, well, we've tried in the past and nothing's ever happened. Uh, it never it always gets swept under the carpet, so I'm going to make somebody else deal with it. Um, and obviously, I'm new to the position uh, that I'm in. You know, my thing is, is like I'll investigate every complaint, but I want to know what you did prior to you sitting in front of me to address the complaint that you filed. And uh, a lot of times, there was zero interaction uh, with anything. And I'm talking; these complaints are not HR complaints. They're more of I didn't like what this guy did, or I felt that this was dangerous. You know, and I'm like. Why didn't you handle it? You know, you're a chief. You're a chief of this organization. Um, so I'm kind of bumping my head up against that, and, and I know I can't be the only one in the fire service that uh, is no, notice, well, you, noticing Dave, this. I, now that you, Dave, now that you put it like that, um, across the fire service, if I had to say that there's one issue across the career and volunteer um, service that causes significant unrest is that our office don't see themselves as managers. They see themselves as highest paid firefighters or most popular firefighters in this position of steam because they're good at firefighting. And that's really where the coaching and mentoring comes in is that people have to be taught that they have to be able to wear their rank. There are things that they can handle at their level, There are things that, if it's going to affect the liability of the fire department or the safety of the public that needs to be pushed up, and they need to be told straight out that we're okay with you handling things at your level, but the military has a saying you should never be the lowest rank with the information. So if you handle something as a lieutenant and say two people were in an argument but they didn't – no physical contact at all. It was just a verbal argument, say, about one shift cleaning tools – and one shift not doing enough. Um, You sit them both down. You think that you came up with a plan. You got them to commit to some remedy of it. You still want to pass that up to the battalion chief, but you want to pass it up in a way of, we had this happen. I handled it. I documented that we were able to do it with a verbal warning, um, and I got them to commit to a plan. I'm going to follow it up 30, 60, and 90 days to make sure that everything's going good and the tools are getting clean. What that does is, is if that firefighter has a problem on another shift, well, now you can see that there's a pattern. If the officer just handles something that he thinks could could potentially get out of control later, um, then you, you miss that pattern. But the officers have to be empowered to be managers, and a lot of our officers don't see themselves as managers. They think they get promoted just to be firefighters. I think some of it falls back to <clears throat> the – we don't teach our officers to be managers. You know, you go from riding the back step to riding the front seat. And with the exception of, you know, taking a test, uh, you know, whether it be a written test and an assessment center and all the books and papers and policies that you had to read, we never really drilled into them – how to be a manager. I mean, yeah, they they probably know how to pull lines. They know how to uh, force a door. They know how to, you know, cut a hole in a roof. They know how to tell people how to do that stuff. But when it comes to that station management stuff, that admin stuff, we don't teach our officers how to be officers. And that carries over when they go from lieutenant to captain, when they go from captain to battalion chief. And once you achieve that rank of, of command officer, that battalion chief, you're responsible, you know, for a whole bunch of people. And if you don't know how to handle manage conflict or you don't know how to, to resolve uh, issues that you may have with somebody else and you just pass the buck up to let somebody else handle it, I think we failed in the fire service to teach people to be managers. Um, you know, we can teach you all day long how to do the tactics. It's the strategic stuff. It's the administrative stuff that, that I don't think – we teach people, uh, and like you said, there's that mentoring and then there's that coaching, but that mentorship is only as good as that person that's, that's giving the, men, the mentor if they never be, came up with that stuff uh, when they, when they, when they uh, promoted up and they didn't learn how to do it. And I think we're, we're just kind of creating this 
this terrible cycle of people not knowing how to resolve conflict without pushing up the chain of command to the chief because somebody may or may not have hurt my feelings. Um, absolutely. And ho- let's, let's hope that everybody's sending around the Side Alpha Leadership Podcast and they're reading books, stay in the books. Even if you're not reading a book about the fire service, it's okay to read a management book, read a leadership book. The one thing that I will caution everybody on, and I've seen this happen more than once, is you get somebody who reads one management book, and then they think they're, they're, they're that person right. for the next six months. Um, you still have to be genuine to yourself, but you will pick up, um, something for each book you read, each podcast you listen, and you kind of mold that into your style. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I've got you know a, a, an entire bookcase full of books that I've read, uh, and I tell people, I said, you know, if you don't like to read, go get an Audible account and just listen to books when you're in your car on your way to work. You don't have to emulate that author, but you can get ideas uh, that may pertain to a situation that you're in and how to handle that, but you don't have to, you know, be that person. You got to, like you said, be authentic. You got to be yourself, but take the advice that that leaders that or managers that are writing books, um, the advice that they give, and weigh it out. Is that something that I can use? Now, not every person that writes a leadership book is a good leader. Um, there's lots of terrible books out there, but there's a lot of good books out there, and and. Uh, if the fire service isn't going to grab the bull by the horns and uh, and start teaching leadership at the at the station or the department level instead of say, sending your people out to you know across the country or whatever to try to get you know a year's worth of leadership in a two day class, I think we're failing our guys, and I think that we need to have assigned reading, have you know I know the military has assigned books that they have to read. They have a reading list. Um, it's constantly uh, in flux, but it's books out there that have come recommended by command that they've used in the past to mold to where they are. Um, I think we need to have something like that in the fire service if we're not going to actually come up with a a, cl- a recognized class like emergency medical technician that's recognized through the country. Do we have that um uh, fire department leadership that can be recognized to the country and not something that's just subjective, something that uh, is going to allow these people to actually be leaders, be problem solvers, be uh, chief officers uh, when it comes to the admin stuff. I mean, we can all command fires, but we need to be able to take care of issues as they pop prop as they, as they crop up in the fire service and not have to say, well, I'm not dealing with that. I'm just going to push it up to my boss. Um, to me, that's a cop out, and and to me that that when I see somebody that does that and they didn't go bother to try to go through the steps to resolve it, to me, uh, if I don't know you, it's going to take you a long time to get that credibility back in my mind, um, regardless of what people say, whether you're a good guy or not. I'm just what I'm seeing firsthand. And maybe that's something that the fire service could do a better job with, with saying, "Hey, we have twenty firehouses. We're going to do." two books a year that we're going to give to all 20 firehouses as a drill on management or leadership. And then we could discuss it. It'd be something that you could talk about at the kitchen table. Um, if you got a fire department with three firehouses or four firehouses, maybe you do a quarterly recommended book. It'd give you something to discuss at the, at the kitchen table. Um, there's all innovative ways to motivate and coach people to get them to read. Yeah, I, I think that uh, you know we've got you know you and I know some really smart people that that have a really good handle on <clears throat> leadership and leading people and conflict resolution and stuff like that. It's it's the fact that I I would want these chiefs and these captains to be able to look inside themselves and like, well, why are why am I not handling this? Why do I got to kick it to the battalion chief or the assistant chief or the operations chief to handle something that I should really be handling? on my own level um and and that'd be the end of it um it's just to me it's it's either a cop-out because they don't want to do it or they don't know how to do it and that's why you got to coach and mentor them so that they know they have the ability to handle certain things at their rank and certain things need to be be passed up that's the one great thing about being a chief in any fire department 
or any officer, there's always work to be done, and we could always do a little bit better. I agree. And with that, we're coming up on the one-hour mark, or as as Frank famously says, we're coming up on the witching hour. Um, I want to thank you for coming on the show yet again. Um, you always have some really good insight um, of, of – just stuff in the fire service that really lends out to, to the leadership realm. Um, and while I got you on here, I want you to plug your book because I'm, I'm pretty excited for it to come out. Uh, not just because I had a little part in it, but just I think that when we're talking about this leadership, there's a lot of stuff in there that uh, people can really grab onto and, and, and really kind of um, recognize uh, for themselves or put themselves into the chapters that, that you've written and hopefully gain something out of that. So talk a little bit about your book. Um, real quick, uh, the name of the book is Command Presence, How to Increase Your Influence or Increase Your Influence. I think we, we you know, parsed it down a little bit. And it will be released at FDIC next year. Uh, Dave has been a contributor. We have so many great authors that contributed to this book. Essentially, it's a book that goes over uh, my successes and failures as a chief officer, as from the union perspective, from winning the United States Supreme Court case. And what was really humbling about writing the book is as I got to the end of it, I realized I wrote a lot more about my failures and lessons learned than I did about my successes because that's where I really grew as a leader. So I'm real excited about the book. The foreword of the book was written by Chris Bedford, who's a senior editor for The Federalist, and um, it's going to hopefully transcend the fire service and we'll be able to sell it to all markets. And again, um, Dave, your wife was just instrumental in getting my initial proposal out. She helped me edit it. And, of course, you contributed Anthony Castro, Anthony Avillo. Uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, Frank Lucuso, of the people that stepped up to uh, Dave McGlenn, who's somebody who should definitely be on your show. And I want to end with this because I know you're – we talked a little bit about Patton in the beginning. And I don't know if you knew this, but I just found out this from Dave McGlenn, who used to be the training officer at West Point, is that at West Point – there's a statue of General Patton, and he has binoculars, and he's looking out into the distance. And there's, you know, a plaque commemorating him as one of the greatest generals of all time. But what people don't realize is where it was placed was placed there on purpose. And what it was, the reason it was placed there is the library is behind him. And what I didn't know is when General Patton went to West Point, um, I, I'm hoping I get the story right, he had to repeat a grade. And he was at like the bottom of his class. And when somebody asked them after they were victorious in World War II, before he died in that tragic accident, they said, you know, how, how do you explain that you were such a successful general and yet you had to repeat or you were at the bottom of your West Point class? And his only answer was, well, I guess I just couldn't find the library. So <laughs> he's looking with binoculars away from the library. So I thought that was great. I said, oh, that's a great story. And what I think the lesson is, is that you can't learn everything from a book. It's got to be a balance between training, knowledge, and education. And you got to find that balance, and you got to be willing to make mistakes, admit your mistakes, and grow and continue forward. And it's just been such an honor to be on your show again. And uh, I hope you have a great night. And tell the wife and family I said hi. You got it. Thanks a lot, Frank, and I will talk to you later. All right. Take care. See you.